since you took your love away. I go out every night and sleep all day since you took your love away. Since you're gone, I can do whatever I want. I can see without song Nothing can stop these lonely tears from falling Tell me baby What did I do wrong I could put my arms round every boy I see But they only remind me Remind me of you doctor and guess what he told me guess what he told me he said girl you better try and have fun no matter what you do but he's a fool cause nothing compares nothing compares to you all the flowers that you planted mama in the backyard all died when you sometimes hard but I'm willing to give it another try cause nothing compares nothing compares to you hello again not a huge shift you'll recognize the view um, but this is my mother's favorite view and uh, this is a special salon, uh, nestling actually, I'd planned it as a, as a Mother's Day special, so it's my ruminations on mothers, our relationship with mothers and my mother. Um, but it actually, I'm filming it, I realised on International Women's Day, um, as you know I film these a couple of days before I show them. Um, so uh, the, the fact that it's nestled in between International Mother's Day and, and, and Mother's, International Women's Day and Mother's Day, feels uh, really pleasant actually and appropriate and quite a lot of the themes of, of, the, of the salon uh, will tie in with uh, both those days. Um, obviously I'm starting here with, uh, I've just gone for a standard mother's ruin, just a bit of gin. Uh, and I very much suggest, my mother's favourite cocktail is a gin fizz as well, um, and I very much suggest that um, you try Mother's Ruin Gin. If you look it up online, it's a fantastic gin made by a woman I came across interviewing Greenham women. Uh, and there's a bit of a recurring theme in this salon about Greenham because my mum was a Greenham woman and took me to Greenham. Um, so we're going to start with the idea of mums as heroines or heroes um, and kind of kick-ass mums. Um, I don't know how you, how, I think relationships with mums are complicated and not everyone's mum is still around. I'm here looking at the view that my mum wanted to look at while she died in the room that she died in. Um, and I sung that first song because it's obviously a song that Sinead O'Connor made famous singing that kind of with her thoughts of her mother in her mind. Um, and I definitely recognise the feeling of um, thinking, well, this has been interesting after a couple of years of my mum being dead and thinking, oh, that has been interesting and now I'm ready for her to come back. Um, but it doesn't make the relationship any less complicated, does it? Uh, the life and death of it all. So um, I'm going to start with someone who's also complicated. Uh, I'm going to start with an extract from The Bloody Chamber by Angela Carter. Um, and this is the first story I think I really read where a mum was an absolute kick-ass hero. Uh, they've been heroic in other ways, they've been emotionally available and all sorts of other things, but I hadn't read something like this. 
Um, it's obviously a retelling of the, if you don't know it, it's not obvious at all, it is a retelling of the Bluebeard story. This is a book of retellings of classic children's literature and, and classic fables told for a, a more adult audience. Um, and uh, at this point, we're quite near the end of the story. Transgressions have been made. Bluebeard is poised to murder his bride and she is waiting for her fate. So we pick it up from there. Already almost lifeless, cold at heart, I descended the spiral staircase to the music room, but there I found I had not been abandoned. I can be of comfort to you, the blind boy said, though not much use. We pushed the piano stool in front of the open window so that, for as long as I could, I would be able to smell the ancient re reconciling smell of the salt sea. And in time, remember that will cleanse everything. Scour the old bones white, wash away all the stains. The last little chambermaid had trotted across the causeway long ago, and now the tide, fated as I was, was tumbling in, the crisp wavelets splashing on the old stones. You do not deserve this, he said. Who can say what I deserve or no, I said. I've done nothing, but who may say that is not sufficient reason for condemning me? You disobeyed him, he said. That is sufficient reason for him to punish you. I only did what I knew, what he knew I would. Like Eve, he said. The telephone rang a shrill imperative. Let it ring. But my lover lifted me up and set me on my feet. I knew I must answer it. The receiver felt heavy as earth. The courtyard, immediately. My lover kissed me and took my hand. He would come with me if I would lead him. Courage. When I thought of courage, I thought of my mother. And then I saw a muscle in my lover's face quiver. Hoofbeats, he said. I cast one last desperate glance from the window and like a miracle, I saw a horse and rider galloping at speed along the causeway through the waves crashing now high at the horse's fetlocks. A rider, her black skirts tucked up around her waist so she could ride hard and fast. A crazy, magnificent horsewoman in widow's weeds. As the telephone rang again. Am I to wait all morning? Every moment my mother drew nearer. She'll be too late, my lover said. And yet he could not restrain the note of hope that, though it might be so, oh, yet it might not be so. The third intransient call. Shall I come up to heaven to fetch you down, St Cecilia? You wicked woman. Do you wish me to compound my crimes by desecrating the marriage bed? So I must go down to the courtyard where my husband waited, in his London tailored trousers and the shirt from Turnbull and Asser, beside the mounting block with in his hand the sword, the heavy sword, unsheathed, grey as that November morning, sharp as childbirth, mortal. When my husband saw my companion, he observed, <laughs> let the blind lead the blind, eh? But does a youth as besotted, even as you, think she can truly be blind to her own desires when she took my ring? Give it me back, whore. The fires in the opal had all died down. I gladly slipped it from my finger, and even in that dolorous place my heart was lighter for the lack of it. My husband took it lovingly and lodged it on the tip of his little finger. It would go down no further. It will serve me for a dozen fiancés, he said. To the block, woman. Slowly, slowly, one foot before the other I crossed the cobbles. The longer I dawdled on my execution, the more time it gave the avenging angel to descend. Don't loiter, girl. Do you think I shall lose my appetite for the meal if you're so long about serving it? No, I grow hungrier, more ravenous, with each moment more cruel. Run to me. Run. I have a place prepared for your exquisite corpse in my display of flesh. He raised the sword and cut bright segments from the air with it, but I lingered, although my hopes, so recently raised, had now begun to flag. If she's not here by now, her horse must have stumbled on the causeway, have plunged into the sea. My husband lay bared, my, lay my branded forehead on the stone, and as he had done once before, 
twisted my hair into a rope and drew it away from my neck. Such a pretty neck, he said with what seemed genuine retrospective tenderness, a nape like the stem of a young plant. And I felt the silken bristle of his beard and the wet touch of his lips as he kissed my neck. And once again, my apparel must go and I retain only my gems. The sharp blade ripped my dress in two and it fell away from me. A little green moss growing in the crevices of the mounting block would be the last thing I should see in all the world. The whiz of that heavy sword. (gasps) And a great battering and pounding at the gate, jangling at the bell, the frenzied neighing of a horse. The unholy silence of the place shattered in an instant. The blade did not descend. The necklace did not sever. My head did not roll. For an instant, the beast wavered in his stroke, a sufficient split second of astonished indecision to let me spring upright and dart to the assistance of my lover as he struggled sightlessly with the great bolts that kept her out. The Marquis stood transfixed, my husband utterly dazed at a loss. It must have been as if he was watching his beloved Tristan for the twelfth, the thirteenth time, and Tristan stirred and then leapt from his briar in the last act, announced in a jaunty aria interposed from Verdi that bygones were bygones, crying over spilt milk never did anyone any good, and as for himself, he proposed to live happily ever after. The puppet master, open mouthed, wide eyed, impotent at last, saw his dolls break free of their chains abandon the rituals he'd ordained for them since time began and begin to live for themselves. The king, aghast, witnessed the revolt of his pawns. You, you never saw such a wild thing as my mother. Her hat seized by the winds and blown out to sea so that her hair was her white mane. Her black loose legs exposed to the thigh, her skirts tucked into her waist, one hand on the reins of the rearing horse, the other clasped my father's service revolver. And behind her, the breakers of the savage indifferent sea, like the witnesses of furious justice. And my husband stood stock still as if she had been the Medusa, the sword still raised over his head, as if in one of those clockwork tableaus of Bluebeard that you see in glass cases at fairs. And then it was as though some curious child pushed his centine into the sot and set it all in motion. The heavy bearded figure roared out aloud, braying with fury and wielding the the honourable sword as if it were a matter of death or glory, charged us all three. On her 18th birthday, my mother had disposed of a man-eating tiger that had ravaged the villages in the hills north of Hanoi. Now, without a moment's hesitation, she raised my father's gun, took aim, and put a single irreproachable bullet through my husband's head. Thank you very much. Oh, Angela Carter. Um, So in a minute, I'm gonna sing you a song about uh, the more another more complex uh, or more less less uh, straightforwardly heroic uh, moment in in terms of motherhood um and i'm playing it on my on my uke uh, mrs lovely which is my slightly bigger my tenor uke uh, so mrs lovely's named after my mum because that was my dad's nickname for my mum so mrs lovely feels like a nice thing to play while i'm sitting in my mum's rocking chair and all that um but first i'm going to read you another extract because i want to read i found something in uh from that my lovely mother-in-law, another mother figure in my life, gave me, which was the autobiography of Agatha Christie. Um, and it's so charming. For a start, I want to say, just read it, it's lovely. <laughs> I mean, there's a lot of casual racism and sexism and internalised misogyny, but there's also, just mostly, it's jollying through her her life and thoughts in a, in a way that I had not expected, given how, how structured she is and how little dialogue she uses in a lot of her detective novels. I think it's a very... Uh, a very charming read for the most part. Um, and this account of sea bathing really made me think of the fact that I'm not a mother myself, um, but I'm an older sister. And it made me think of the, the relationship we have when we're with someone younger than us and the care, uh, the care that generations uh, experience, which is 
if not motherhood, it's almost also maternal and of interest to me. It just struck me as a nice little thing. So I'm going to read you this little extract from uh, an autobiography by Agatha Christie. Bathing was one of the joys of my life and has remained so almost to my present age. In fact, I would still enjoy it as much as ever, but for the difficulties attendant on a rheumatic person getting herself into the water and, even more difficult, out again. Bathing as I first remember it was strictly segregated. There was a special ladies bathing cove, a small stony beach, to the left of the bath salons. The beach was a steeply sloping one, and on it there were eight bathing machines in charge of an ancient man of a somewhat irascible temper, whose non-stop job it was to let the machine go up and down to the water. We called him the old seahorse. <laughs> you entered your bathing machine, a gaily painted striped affair, saw that both doors were securely bolted, and then began to undress with a certain amount of caution, because at any moment the elderly man might decide it was your turn to be drawn down to the water, and at that moment, there'd be a frantic rocking and the bathing machine would grind its way slowly over the loose stones, flinging you about from side to side. After swimming, partaking of my current bun or whatever refreshment I was having, I would reply dutifully, no, no, Granny, I won't stay in as long next time. But actually, Granny, the weather was, the water was really warm. Oh, really warm, was it? Then why are you shivering from head to foot? Why are your fingers so blue? I do remember once I was with my young nephew Jack and I and we nearly drowned ourselves one summer. It was a rough day. We had not gone as far as, as Meadford but instead down to the ladies bathing cove where Jack was not yet old enough to cause a tremor in female breasts. He could not swim at the time or only a few strokes so I was in the habit of taking him out to the raft on my back. On this particular morning we started off as usual but it was a curious kind of sea a sort of mixed swell and chop and with the additional weight on my shoulders i found it impossible to keep my mouth and nose above water i was swimming but i couldn't get enough breath into myself the tide was not so far out um, so that the raft was quite close but i was making little progress and only able to catch a breath every third stroke suddenly i realized I could not make it. At any moment now, I was going to choke. Jack, I gasped, get off and swim to the raft. You're nearer to that than the shore. Why, said Jack, I don't want to. P please d do, I bubbled. My head went under. I, I noticed by the time that he'd reached the raft without much difficulty, um, but I also noticed that um, in my mind, there was only a feeling of great indignation. I had always been told, you see, that when you were drowning, the whole of your past life flashed before you, and I'd also heard you would hear beautiful music. Well, there was no beautiful music, and, and nothing at all had passed before me about my past life. In fact, I could think of nothing but about how I was going to get some breath into my lungs. Everything went black, and, and, and the next thing I knew, I was violent bruises and pains as I was flung roughly into a boat. The old seahorse, crotchety and useless as we had always thought him, had had enough sense to notice that someone was drowning and had come out in the boat allowed him for the purpose. Having thrown me into the boat, he took a few more strokes to the raft and grabbed Jack, who resisted loudly, saying, I don't want to go in yet. I've only just got here. I want to play on the raft. I won't come in. The assorted boatland reached the shore. My sister came down to the beach laughing heartily and saying, What were you doing? What was all the fuss? Your sister nearly drowned herself, said the old man crossly. Go and take this child of yours. We'll lay her out flat and see if she needs a bit of punching. I suppose they did give me a bit of punching, though I don't think I quite lost consciousness. I can't see how you knew she was drowning. Why she didn't shout for help? I keeps an eye. Once you go down, you can't shout. The warder's coming in. We all thought highly of the old seahorse after that. So I'm going to sing you my second song now. Um, and uh, this is one that... Uh, I don't know exactly what it's about. But I really remember... I've always... My, my family... My mum and my dad really introduced me to Kirsty McColl. It's a Kirsty McColl song. 
that you can read in a lot of things about it that are about much less positive relationships with mothers um, and what we as women hand on to each other if we don't get our our shit sorted out, I guess. Um, I also really remember that, of course, Kirsty McCall died um, in, a, in a water accident. She was hit by a playboy when she was on holiday in the waters of um, Latin America. And the, her mother campaigned so hard for justice for her um, and had uh, vigils every year for her in Soho. I went to a couple. They were lovely. Um, and again, it's that sort of feeling of um, there are mothers that are heroes that can't avenge their children. But it doesn't mean they love them any less or the children were any less awesome, I suppose. screwing my own mental health but Fridays and Saturdays she walks down those alleyways a latter day lady of the land how you doing you ain't from round here won't you come in still do it anyways and anything is better than out there now don't wake me up again and don't let me feel anything but when you go let me dream Mothers ruin their own little girls Keep them dreaming There's more to this world But turn her the other way And every day is Father's Day He stays until there's nothing left to say But don't wake me up again and don't let me feel anything But when you go Let me dream that I go with you Cause I can't take it round here anymore Leave the light on and don't shut the door So I will be uh, forever grateful that my mum uh, took me to Greenham because uh, it was a radicalising experience for her as a, as a woman and it meant that she brought us up uh, in a radical feminist tradition which I uh, am a freaking love. And um, when she died, I spoke a lot to my really great friend Diana Goldie, um, Diana Goldie, who made this amazing representation of my mum. She takes like your, your, your feelings, your memories, your events, and she makes them into textile art. It's pretty phenomenal. Um, and I had put round it the, a little, just a, just a bit of a poem that made me really think of, of my mum. Um, and it's by Adrian Mitchell. Um, and I weirdly, this is a total sidebar, I used to work in his wife's bookshop who's called Celia, she was great. Uh, she'd only have, it was, our, it was our young, a jobbing actress in London. She only trusted young female, it's like young actresses, so young female actors. Uh, so we all, there was a whole load of us all worked there, which meant we were really good with the books, beautiful secondhand books. I worked for books quite often. <laughs> she has not be paid as so I could save up to buy, get one of these gorgeous books. Um, and, um, but we were all pretty much all terrible at maths. So we had like, we didn't even have a till, we just had a little money box, uh, but it was great. And Celia was awesome. She was and had been an actor herself. And uh, every now and then, Adrian, would, Adrian Mitchell would come bounding in, um, and be very, very charming with his beautiful. They had a beautiful golden lab uh, retriever uh, called Daisy, the dog of peace. Um, and so when I started to look into his work, it also started to make me really think of my mum. 
and the fact that one thing she loved about Greenham was the personal responsibility that everyone took there, the kind of anarchist ethic of um, of taking care of each other, taking responsibility for your own actions. Um, yeah, so this is what uh, is written around the edge of this beautiful piece of art by Diane. It says, my brain socialist, my heart anarchist, my eyes pacifist, and my blood revolutionary. That I feel like sums up my mum, which is quite cool. <sighs> so um, I'm gonna, as an ode to, um, as an ode to uh, those marvelous women of Greenham and everything they created for us, which is in itself, of course, a gift of a, a birthing and a gift of creation. When you women inspire women, and uh, they left us a lot to be inspired about. And they're still doing a lot of it as well, of course. So um, I'm going to read you a poem by uh, a lovely woman who's in our interview archive. If you want to have a look at, uh, listen to some of the interviews, there are Greenham women everywhere, and they're just phenomenal. Um, this is by uh, Sold Ishtar, uh, and it's called And Women Dance. In Gamma, cold and empty, a graveyard to male violence, the land yearns to breathe freely again, and women dance. Once again, women dance on the silos, dance around a fire, a beacon of strength, a promise of another way, a fire that contains all the fires, all the loving and struggles of 10 long years. The gates have been opened, freeing the land, freeing our hearts, our lives and women dance, weaving our visions into the lands, reclaiming the common, the earth. This death place is man's domain. Women are forbidden here. They strut around, boasting of their power, but their language belies the lie. They are afraid of women, of the land. They cannot find us. We're hidden, protected by the silent darkness. The land is strong here, and still we dance. In their fear, they weld the gates shut, trapping themselves inside forever. Women cut down the fences, leaving the gates they will never open again, standing alone, silent sentinels to a crazed world, messengers of women's power. We know who is the strongest here. They know they have lost control. Women will not let our lives be bound by men's fear. We will dance on the land. We will climb to the watchtowers to see beyond the confines they create. We will light fires of life in the bellies of their death machines. We will reclaim the common, the sacred earth, and there is nothing, absolutely nothing they can do to stop us. And of course the common is common land again now. Greenham Common has been given back to the people. And um, very excitingly, uh, we're going to recreate the walk that the Green and Women did. So please join us at the end of August. Um, we're going to walk all the way from Cardiff to Newbury and celebrate the Green and Women. And we'd love you to bring your campaigns and, you, and your passion and your parents, <laughs> your mums um, or your children. Um, and uh, and we'll, uh, we'll all inspire each other. I can't believe that's going to happen. It's going to happen. Well, there's more about that to come. But um, yeah, that's uh, that's quite a mad thing we've decided to do, and we're going to do it. That's, that's scary little girls and green women everywhere. Um, so a final memory and a final song for you on my little uk, my little ukulele. Going back to her. Um, it's been really nice to share this with you. Thank you very much. Here's to mothers and daughters everywhere, and to all of you watching. Um, quite a tender one to do this um, in my capacity as a non-mum and a bereaved daughter and an older sister and a creative I suppose um, hopefully yeah thank you for sharing it with me um, I did use to, my mum one of the many radical things she did uh, my mum and dad decided uh, that they would uh, homeschool me and my brother and I would be home educated I was I'm older than my brother by about 10 nearly 10 years so um, I was home educated for a long time before him it was a very uh, loose home education as in there was no formal structure uh, so I did a lot of reading and watching old films and then going and finding my mum and saying, 
this has just happened, what does it mean? And it was fantastic, honestly. Um, and one of the things that happened was I, I would find these old films, but I'd never catch the beginning. So I would go and say to her, oh, there was this brilliant, there were, there were some there were movie stars, and then they, they, they one of them um, wasn't, she was a blonde woman and she had a squeaky voice, and she tried to steal someone else's voice, and then there was a big tap dancing number, and mum would be like, oh, singing in the rain, and it's blah, blah. And she'd guess from these really random bits that I as a child had remembered and liked, and she would know the films, and it was just so cool. And one of the films that I really love, which I think is really interesting, is um, Gold Diggers of 1933. And this is to kind of tie in, it's kind of, it's a re one of the really early experiences I had of seeing something uh, that was massively anti-military. And it's, a, it's it finishes basically, it's a hilarious film and a lovely film, but it's all about the depression. It's pre the, the, the code, it's pre-code era. It's before McCarthyism and the blacklist. So they basically, make a lot of fun out of the situation that's caused the depression whilst bigging up the people that are suffering from it and giving them their full voice. And they finish it with a massive dig at unemployment and the, and the way that people come back from war or, or come from the land and farming and are just abandoned by the state and by the rich. And I think that's incredibly brave. And I can remember that being a point of discussion with me and my mum and a real education. Um, it's a fantastic piece of songwriting. Um, I'm going to do... Uh, a quick little bit of it um but you must if you if this is if you, if you take nothing else away from this have a little look at this at the end it's a bit it's a bit heteronormative honestly it's a bit man man, man woman needs a man type stuff but the point of it is to say is really is really uh in the context of the film to say why have we abandoned all these people to the depression it's a very interesting and very few statements as socialist as it get to be made in the golden age of cinema for much longer afterwards so, so it's really it's really epic uh, in the film it's not going to be that epic here. I'm going to put on my little uke and just give you a flavour. But this is uh, just to remember that how much I loved watching these old films with my mum and chatting to them about, about, about them with her. And uh, to say thank you for watching this. Um, and uh, yeah, hopefully see you uh, soon at a salon and later in the year on a, on a march to, to Greenham. Forgotten man, you put a rifle in his hand. You sent him far away, you shouted hip hooray, but look at him today. Remember my forgotten man, you had him cultivate the land. He walked behind the plough, the sweat fell from his brow, but look at him right now. And once he used to love me, I was happy then. He used to take care of me. Won't you bring him back again? Cause ever since the world began, a woman's got to have a man. Forgetting him, you see, means you're forgetting me. Like my forgotten